All right, everybody. Welcome, 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 and welcome again to another episode of Behind the Visual with Mark Hansen. That's me, advertising lifestyle photographer. I'm also the guy who brings you this podcast where I interview all those people responsible for all the images and videos you see out in your world every single day. And today, my guest is Nate Johnson. He is the Associate Creative Director at Digitas Health in Philadelphia. We talk about all kinds of cool stuff. We talk about a model who showed up missing something that they had no idea the model was missing. So um, yeah, it was something kind of important, but they were able to work around it and fixed it. So check that story out. We talk about how Nate spent all of his high school in Hong Kong. And part of that, he even spent by himself with his parents in different countries and him all alone in Hong, in Hong Kong. So check that part out. And also we talk about what it's like doing something different at a healthcare agency and all the stuff it takes to make that happen because it's so regulated. We also talk about how he loves to build amps for guitars and hi-fi systems. We talk about his pumpkin carving, which is absolutely amazing you guys if you can uh, look at this on youtube check that out at some point and then also uh we talk a little bit about everything else like driving cross country for one thing and um yeah just lots of cool stuff so check this one out let me know what you think i enjoyed it i hope you enjoy it as well and uh look forward to hearing from you guys like it subscribe to it thumbs up it comment all that kind of stuff and i look forward to hearing from everybody And I was looking over your website and all this stuff. And when you say tons of hobbies, you're not lying. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's start off. Okay. So where did you grow up? Because I see that you went to SCAD, but yeah. you also went to Hong Kong International School. So how did that, what's the deal with all that? Yeah, I was born in New Orleans. Both my parents are um, from the South. So my mother's from uh, Southern Mississippi and my okay. father's from Baton Rouge. Um but we moved virtually every two years of my life. Um, Why? So we lived all over New England. Uh, my parents were actually kind of cool. They like, um, they, you know, flipped who had sort of job priorities, okay. our career priorities about every once in a while. So if my mother had a really cool job opportunity, we would follow that. And then, you know, two, three, four years down the line, if my father had a really cool job opportunity, we would follow that. So it, there was not like one breadwinner in my family. Okay. And as a result, we moved just all over the place. Um, in so it was, it was sort of like a promise from my parents as a kid, you know, every time you get uprooted from a school and a group of friends, um, they were like, well, we'll make sure you get to spend high school in one place. And they, they held up that promise when, when we moved to Hong Kong, they let me stay there, even though they moved away. So I oh, had wow. some years just like living alone as a high schooler in Hong Kong. Um, what did your parents do? Was, um, my mother worked in the fashion industry and my okay. father started off in like home goods and then furniture and stuff, but then got into lighting and then from lighting got into glass. So he ended up just being like a glass manufacturer working oh, wow. in China. Okay. Yeah. So you were in Hong, you were living in Hong Kong. Were you living with a family or are you living on your own in high school? When I first moved there, I was living with my family and then right. my mother decided that she wanted to move back to the States and my father kind of like had a half seas thing where he his like official home base was in Hong Kong, but for the most part he was in the States or um, up in mainland China. So uh, really super lucky, uh, you know, uh, I guess I was lucky because I like didn't get yeah. involved with any with anything super sketchy or scary, but also just really lucky because, uh, you know, so many cool things to be exposed to as a kid and to have that kind of freedom and you know to be a little skateboard skate rat kid who didn't have a curfew and who could just do whatever that That's he wanted cool. um yeah it was really cool and i was also really lucky to be at a pretty progressive international school over there that really you know understood my needs and understood my style and did some cool things like i had teachers you know that let me you know kind of forget about homework a little bit so long as I made great test grades that kind of stuff oh, you know and cool. uh those you know having teachers that understood that kind of stuff um 
I think because people learn differently and kids learn differently. And yeah. I really, I really could give two crafts about um, doing homework and stuff if I got the concepts. And right. So, yeah. I've always thought that by the time you hit high school, you should be able to at least your second year of high school be able to pick and choose what you want to continue taking. Like there was no reason for me to keep taking math and science by the time I hit my second year of high school because I knew. I was not going to do anything with math and science at that level. I mean, yeah. I could do the fractions and the adding and subtracting and dividing and I'm good. I'm never going to do the whole A over B divided by C equals whatever the hell. I don't know. The shit my that daughters said, do, I can't do. That said, I bet you, I know me personally, but I bet you as well um, do a little bit of algebra every single time you have to calculate a ratio, right? Like, okay. 38, 40, 21, 60 is what at, at this other resolution? Like we kind of know those shorthands, I think, yeah, as, yeah. as like digi digital visual designers. Um, yep. But yeah, all of my paper uh, is is at least every other sheet has some sort of ratio math on it, just so I can get that kind of stuff right. Okay. All right. Well, you're not helping my argument. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I, it's just art, you know. <laughs> no, I get it. No, you're, I mean, and you're right. I hadn't thought about that. So, you, yes, yeah. you were right. Okay. So, I'm going to say I didn't need algebra two trig forward. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really, um, I didn't even take pre calc. Um, yeah. I kind of wish I did as an adult now. I don't know if Sometimes. I did or not. I don't know. My daughter's taking stuff. I just look at it and go, I don't even know what that means. I, don't, I yeah. can't understand any of it. By the time they're in fifth grade, I was having to look up stuff on uh, Google to help them yeah. with homework. Yeah. So, so how long were you? So you graduated from high school in Hong Kong. Is that when yeah. you, did you go straight to SCAD after that? I did. Yeah. Um, were you already drawing? Obviously, you were already drawing because you went to SCAD. But, so were you doing like paintings and drawings and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, way fine earlier? Arts. All my life, my mother's side of the family, they're all professional artists. Oh, so, wow. um, or semi-professional or whatever. My aunt, right. you know, uh, actually I have a great aunt and a, an aunt, both of whom spent most of their careers um, as professional fine artists. My mother's sister is a tattoo artist. Oh, wow. um, and my mother worked in fashion. And now that she's retired, she, um, you know, is painting every single day. That's cool. Yeah. So you were surrounded by it. Yeah, I kind of knew we were going to do an art school path from the very, very beginning. Um, and But once I got to art school, I was like, what am I going to do now? So there's so many options. There. How was that? How was that when you got there? It was great. You know, the, um, I, I, I think the, the deal, you know, this is like not an official deal, but the deal that my parents kind of struck was like, you come from a southern family you've never like actually lived in the south since you were a little kid right except in florida which you know that south count. florida it doesn't really yeah. count um and so they were really eager for me to uh follow my pursuits but also like at least get a little bit of understanding because a, a big part of my family's from georgia okay. um, and and thank god i did it because savannah i think it's like the most beautiful city in america it's such a great time there especially savannah in the mid 90s when i was there it was like pretty different than it is now in yeah. that like i remember vividly the day that they were like you're target is going to open a store in savannah and i remember being like <laughs> that's the only <laughs> i and i also remember how like dumb i thought it was that everybody was so excited about this but it's true like at that time before target opened we had a blimpy downtown but that was the only chain store there was like no chain stores there was not even a mcdonald's in in downtown or anything not that that would be good right, yeah. or whatever but there there was no change whatsoever and now you go down there and there's starbucks and anthropology yeah. and there's all this stuff um you know aside from the stores that have opened it doesn't seem like it's that different but i i will say it was you know really sleepy felt really isolated and i loved it coming from hong kong when everything's right. just super connected and you know yeah my dad lives in hilton head so occasionally we drive over to Savannah and hang out. And then I have a uncle that has a place in Savannah. So we go see, him. we've gone to see him a few times. Yeah. I yeah, like Savannah. Cool. I think it's My aunt lives place. in Savannah. She, she's a tattoo artist in Savannah. That's probably pretty decent living in Savannah. <laughs> I imagine so. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of arty kids around, but yeah. also, I, I also imagine that, you know, as an artist, I bet she gets more, I want this, I drew this oh, yeah. um, than anywhere That's else, true. you know? 
Yeah. yeah. Or I heard the most popular tattoo is the butterfly. Not that not a not a bad idea. Ton, great organic shapes fits on the skin. Lo, loads of color. I yes. think it'd be a real real shame to get like a ton of black and white butterflies or a ton of stylized oh, yeah. butterflies. But like, I could imagine a sleeve of butterflies being just beautiful. That would be very cool. Yeah. So they did some study, and evidently the butterfly was the most. It was the number one requested tattoo. Hmm. And they didn't, yeah. they didn't say like a butterfly on what specific part of your body. They were just like a butterfly. But yeah, dude, yeah. I could see a sleeve of butterflies. That yeah. I saw I saw some stuff like that a couple of years ago. I went to Cambodia and we went to like a butterfly farm. And you know, you walk in this net zone. Oh yeah. And not only are there butterflies everywhere, but when they um when they like crowd and collapse onto a, like a single tree or something, yeah. it's unbelievable looking. Yeah, I went to one in Aruba. Did any of the butterflies land on you? Yeah. Man, yeah, and like one. stick bugs and all sorts of stuff. Not one landed on me. Well, My assistant was with me, and I think a model, I can't remember because we were just, it was a, our day off. So I think it was maybe the model, hair and makeup, my assistant, and myself. I think a butterfly landed on everybody but me. Mm. I don't mm. know so, what I was doing. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm still bitter about it. I mean, were you doing were you doing this kind of stuff? No, I was like, come here. Like, I was like trying to go. Maybe I was scaring them because everybody else had got it. I was kind of like, come land on my arm. Yeah. Uh, who the hell knows? So when you graduated, what was your first gig out of school? What was your first job? I freelanced around. I uh, my girlfriend is an architectural conservator, and we met in college. And okay. So, um, we knew we needed to go somewhere where there was like old city stuff where she could work and that was big enough that where I could get some work so I just did freelancing for a really long time this is in the age of like designers working in Quirk Express and stuff like right. that and, yeah. Um, yeah and then and stayed in-house for a really long time eventually moved to ad, to the ad world working at an agency um but did you, go, it, did you go straight to New York no I went to Philly I live in Philly oh you're now. in Philly okay yeah. Yeah, so I know if you like went to New York. So that's right. Everything you did is kind of in Philly, right? What about Gap? Yeah, it, yeah, that's also in Philly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, I was only there for like I don't know three or four months. An embarrassing part of my right. <laughs> career. <yeah. laughs> is there a big difference though between say working at Gap, which is like this huge retail place, versus an agency? Well, the gap that I worked at wasn't even a retail place. It was a, a consultancy. Um, oh, really? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not associated with the clothing company whatsoever. It was a uh, like, you know, going from in house and then wanting to dip your toe in kind of an agency ish type thing. Right. Uh, we're getting consultancy, and then from there, it was just like, nah, I'm just gonna go work at an agency. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like the agency? I love it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I loved it before COVID a little bit more. Um, right just because it, it's a it's a great place to you know to riff on ideas and just, just think really abstract as long as you possibly can um you know trying to trying to stay in pencil world or in just like brain world for the until the very last second when you have to grab a ma grab a mouse or something is Do you sketch anything out special. still hell yeah yeah, yeah. still sketch stuff out i'm like behind me is there's that whiteboard it's yeah. completely empty because we we don't work here very much but like that thing is constantly full of just ideas and even posture and stuff we're sketching things out we're like um you know even taking photos on cell phones of like our, our of posture and in ways that you can express things and comping them all up we're doing everything we possibly can uh to not get things super firm until we have to, you know, right. the, yeah, the more, yeah. at least here, the more you keep it flexible and kind of amorphous visually, um, the less real it becomes and the more the ideas become the hero and right at the forefront. That's cool. Which yeah, is so weird because like all growing up, everything was about, you know, being in the fine arts, uh, you know, and even being, you know, a kid making skate videos and stuff like it's all about the render or it's all about the thing actually on the screen and, right. and, you know, if you don't have a super good bullshit detector you can find like <laughs> uh, you can find a lot of work where you can tell like the image came first and then you know you built in the support for the image and then right. and after that kind of stuff doesn't really fly around here um i think it's we all have pretty good detectors when it's like oh that you know we found an image and then like fit an, a concept to oh, that image yeah, you know yeah, yeah. like that's a <laughs> 
we did, we did that when we were young, but you know, I think we all have really good radar for that kind of stuff nowadays. Well, your clients are probably happy about that. Yeah. I mean, the clients don't really get to see that kind of stuff because right. prior to showing work to clients, you know, we, we polished the hell out of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. So what, so what was your first job straight out of school? Like first after, after the freelancing thing, what was the first thing you took full time? And I, wor I worked for a lot of um, freelancing for a lot of uh, like nonprofits and things like that. Um, move, you know, it, when I moved to Philly, I didn't have to make money. I, I, our first apartment here was quite literally a hundred dollars a month. Um, really? In rent. Oh yeah. Yeah. And oh. then, it, and I'm also kind of lucky because my How girlfriend big was is, that? Um, well, it was like a room in a larger punk house, you know, it's okay. like a, a punk house where six people live there with a shared kitchen. Um, oh, damn. All right. So, yeah. I mean, if you can imagine like the 90s, like punk scene or whatever, like we were right yeah. in it, you know, we bought our groceries at a co-op. I mean, we still buy our groceries at the same co-op. Um, I, I don't think like we've changed that much. I still guess I live in a punk house, except like I'm me and my girlfriend and our dogs are the only ones that live right. in the <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think like the working for nonprofits and then not really having to make money on that and often donating design services um, to things like that. You know, I designed like brochures for uh, nonprofits that brought textbooks into prisons and things like oh, wow. that. Um, and like hunger relief organizations here did a lot of work for a place called Phil Abundance. Um, and then uh, my girlfriend, she's a architectural conservator. I think I mentioned that. So yeah. we actually got an opportunity to move into one of the um, city owned mansions in oh, wow. Park. So like a park mansion, you know, really isolated. And we were the caretakers there for a number of years where, and that was completely rent free, which, wow. you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm like a little embarrassed to admit it because it's like, sounds like such a luxurious thing, but you know, it was rent free living for four years where I was just able to dig around and do whatever I wanted. I think it's great. Yeah. And then once, you know, grew up a little bit, moved, moved back into the neighborhood because we, we got kind of sick of living essentially alone in the middle of a city right. park. Um, have to start making a little bit more what did you, exactly did you have to do when you were living in the mansion well you know like keep the lights on have dogs have, have a presence so that anybody walking by couldn't case the place and figure oh, okay. out like oh it's you know um and then other things you know like improve the property if if an alarm went off call the authority figure you know that kind of right. stuff basically like um Imagine any. So you guys weren't like doing repairs or anything like that. If something needed to be repaired, you called and somebody came. The city sent somebody like, to take care of it, kind of thing. Kind of. We had skills to do repairs. So like, if a window broke, we, you know, I wouldn't really do this, but um, my girlfriend, you know, could take the window out and reglaze a window, or yeah. if, you know, if if something bad happened, we could figure out how to do it. If it was really bad, or if it was a like a long term maintenance thing, that would be handled professionally. Okay. It's amazing what those architects can do, isn't it? And my brother's an architect, and he's he always has a project every single weekend. But he's, yeah. He seems to be doing something. I came over, I went over to his house the first time he bought uh, his first house, and I walk in, and the second bedroom is missing the floor. And he is standing on the dirt looking up at me, and you just see beams, dirt, and him. And he was replacing all the flooring. And uh, That was me last new. year, man. Was that it? was me last. Oh yeah, yeah. We we redid our. We redid a bunch of stuff on the first and second floor of our house. But yeah, I had photos of our bathroom just being joists. Um, oh wow! All the way down through the front, through the kitchen below into the basement, just all being open. Really? Oh yeah, I, I love doing that kind of stuff. And one of my other big hobbies is woodworking stuff. So when we redid our kitchen, you know, I I hand built all the cabinetry for the whole kitchen. Um, but. There, there's I learned how to plaster man I love plastering too really plastering is plastering is really a great fun if you need to learn something kind of meditative and um yeah it's like you know mixing up just beautiful silky lime and and marble mortar and stuff and then when the way you apply it and smooth it out and polish it and wax it it's just it's it's all I don't get super into like you know, washing my car every weekend and wax, right. but I understand people that want to like wash and wax a car because it is kind of like meditative to get a 
nice polish, but you can do it on your on the walls of your house, and it's really just fun. I I, I look for opportunities to do more plaster work because it's been a while. Oh wow! How old's your house? Like eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties. Because it's definitely not new. <laughs> oh no no yeah. no! And and we and we uh, you know, it, and it used every opportunity to build it exactly like it was before. Oh, that's so. cool. Yeah, you know, it's not like wallboard. You know, we put old old lath up old wooden lath and base coat and top coat and then the yeah, final finish right. marble coat and stuff yeah that's um, very cool it's also like fun to do it that way i think it's it'd be kind of sad to walk through your house and be like oh i know that's like wallboard right like, yeah no i think it's good my first studio was in a house that was built in 1920s and it was a, it had you know the same thing it had the plaster walls and yeah. all that kind of stuff because we had to take out part of it to make it there was a little doorway and we needed it wider so we had to go in and take out so we had to take out all that plaster and then redo it and all that to make it mm -hmm. look decent yeah so, but that's um, that's impressive man that plaster thing because that's not an easy thing to just do without screwing it up well we we had a guy the guy who sold us the the plaster because it's like a special lime plaster with like marble in it he, he's such a funny guy he's a real character he came over our house and we thought he was just going to sell us the buckets Right. of of stuff but no he like brought out all the all this lap to show us and actually give us a demo and oh, wow. he's like all right now now you try and we tried it and he's like yeah you got to do this thing a little differently so i every single person i know that's got into lime plastering um is stoked on it and wants to do it and wants to teach everybody else how to do it because it's a it's a really um rewarding part of the trades it's it's worth trying i i highly advise if you've got a wall that you might want to plaster just give it a shot because it's just fun it really is all right now you're making me try and find a place i can go plaster a wall because my yeah. house was built like 1999 or something i don't know when it was built yeah. 92, i don't know you're, don't gonna, know you're know. gonna have to find like a barn somewhere that you can yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey my father-in-law he's got some barns he doesn't use them at all they're just sitting yeah. on there dilapidating they like falling down so maybe i can go in there and fix one of those up yeah. That would be cool. Okay, so when do you got, how long have you been at Digitas now? Oh, I don't know. I'm bad at this kind of stuff. <laughs> Five, uh, it's also tough because I've been in the in the holding company, Yeah, which is Publicis for a long longer time than I've been at Digitas. So I'm not sure. I think I've been in the, uh, at Publicis Group for yeah. eight to 10 years or something. I'm okay. not sure um oh, at fine. dh probably like ten, five years or something like that yeah oh, time time just for me time days of the week holidays it all blurs together i'm the guy who was on the phone yesterday going wait we get days off next week and everybody's like it's labor day you dummy and so like i can't keep track of any of that kind of stuff oh shit that's right yeah okay, there you go <laughs> yeah i was like damn it is it it's like wait yeah. yeah it is labor day next week yeah i forget about yeah. all that too i'm with you yeah. yeah i still think 2000 was you know just another day yeah it feels like it um yeah. Except until I saw that, until I saw that meme that I, that was going around about uh, 1939. Did you say? Yeah, that? Okay. Yes. Like, did you post that? No, I didn't post okay, it. Okay, I, I saw it, it someplace, was, and I was like, that. It made me mad. That really right? Yeah. yeah. It it is right. It just is sucky. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, no. Yeah, uh, even the Wonder Years when they're rebooting the Wonder Years, but. Um, yeah, even that I was like, wait, it, Wonder Years came out in '88 and it depicted '68. Like that's like, yeah, it seemed like forever. 2001. Ago time. Yeah, it really did. Yeah, but yeah, that's only 2001. <laughs> yeah, damn, man. Yeah, time's just flying by. It seems like, or I just don't keep track of it very well. I'm not sure which. Yeah, yeah. I, what, I just you, don't. Go ahead. I just yeah. don't. I don't think it's my personality to keep track of any of that stuff. Like. I've got a bad memory for, I can remember anything that like I see in a movie, but, or TV or a book I read, but yeah. like, what, what were you doing in 2003? I would have no idea. Yeah. I don't know that I know what I was doing. The only, the only time I really keep track of time, I think is maybe if I'm on vacation to make sure I know when I have to leave. And if I've done a job and I'll send in an invoice, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right, it's been 30 days. Have yeah. I gotten paid yet? Yeah. yeah. So that kind of thing. So what was your first job that you thought 
this is cool. This is where I need to be, where I want to be, what I want to do. Hmm. That's tough. You know, when I first got started in like health advertising, I worked a lot on the on the healthcare professional side. So when you're where you're talking to doctors okay. and not talking to patients, that was pretty fascinating because, you know, being a being a kid who's mostly been focused on RD type stuff, a big part of my career prior to this was working in regulated industries and finance and stuff like that. Um, but it was interesting translating uh, sciencey ideas and, and things that were usually going to be going right over my head and actually try to tackle it, get a good understanding of data, get a good understanding of charts, and then applying some of that stuff, you know, you learned in college about uh, just like core design communications to help yeah. help these people who aren't very visually oriented, you know, in the doctor's office, really start to understand some of this data in a really clean, clear way. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was like a bit of a type nerd, maybe a bit of a Luddite. Um, and for my like sort of design thesis, I really didn't want to do like a magazine or a book. I wanted to, um, I was really into chess and stuff. And yeah. I was, I've always been kind of bummed at the lost opportunity for chess notation in newspapers and books. It just that it's alphanumeric doesn't really make sense to me. We live in a world of computers where we can design typefaces that, you know, leverage icons and we can hope to communicate chess games uh, on paper visually different than we had to in the teens right. where you, we were limited to like letterpress and typewriters, you know? Um, and so my thesis was like designing a typeface and redesigning a, a notation system for communicating chess games. Um, Needless to say, it like didn't go over too well. People were, it didn't really <laughs> it didn't really compete with people doing like big art books and photo books and stuff. Right. Um, but I think that some of the stuff that I learned there about just like how do you take uh, like really nuanced, detaily things you know that look like they should be in spreadsheets and actually make them come to life with the importance and weight that they actually carry in the real world. Like when yeah. you're talking about when you're talking about oncology, that's life and death stuff, and it shouldn't be understanding those charts shouldn't be relegated to something that looks like an Excel document, you know? Yeah. Um, and that kind of got me really fascinated. It was like, oh my God, this like boring part of my design career back in college, I can actually start using now, you know? That's very cool. Did yeah, you, so if you were into the chess, did you watch Queen's Gambit? I did. Yeah. That was a I good, really liked it too. Yeah, I, I did really too. I was it. impressed with that whole thing. Yeah. And I'm really into chess. I played chess maybe like five times my entire life. But I watched that. I was like, okay, this is cool. I like this. Yeah. 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 Remember all those scenes of her like flipping through newspapers and magazines, essentially reading letters and numbers. Yeah. It, it's kind of beautiful that people can do it, but it, it, um, it raises the bar with intimidation for like youth getting into it, you know, yeah. and, and, and wanting to do more than just play their buddy, but also wanting to like go back in time literally and watch a game evolve that, you know, was played in 1908. Like you can do that with chess notation and it's really cool. Uh, at the same fidelity that you would go back and watch, you know, like a world series from 1988, you can go to 1908 and watch a, a chess game, which is wow. powerful, you know? Yeah, I'm always amazed at that because I was watching Ted Lasso and the assistant coach is all into chess and he was picked up some woman and they're at a bar or at a party or something. And instead of like hanging out with everybody else, they're literally talking through a chess game. Cause he's yeah. like moved to whatever. I don't know what any of the terminology is, but he was like, you know, yeah. this to this. And then she said this to this. And he was like, mm, I don't know. And then he went, yeah. and it was, I was, I thought that was a trip. Cause I don't know what yeah. any of that means. So I was just going, I have yeah. no clue, but it yeah. was cool. They did all that same stuff in Queens Gambit too, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was, yeah. And my wife was into it and she's usually not into stuff like that's older. Well, she says she's not, but lately she has been because she didn't want to watch Marvelous Mrs. Maisel because it was took her place in the 50s. She's like, I'm not into that. And but she started watching and now it's like one of her favorite shows. So she's yeah, yeah all into that too. So, so far, what's been your favorite job, your favorite project that you've worked favorite on? Favorite individual. What I'm working on now, um, I can't tell you too much about it, right. but um, it's it's the most exciting thing that we've done. It, it um, and the, 
a lot of different reasons for that. It's really different, really special. It's gonna it's gonna stand out and um, as, as something pretty unique. Um, and we we have you know both sides of the business. We have sort of the the consumer commercial type stuff, right. but we also have the what we call unbranded work, which is um, sort of support and education around the condition. Both sides are equally fascinating and both sides are doing something totally different and they're different from one another. So it's it's sort of like a perfect storm of a bunch of really cool creatives that are hungry and eager to not follow the script. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, on our team, we've got enough passion and enough sort of like excitement around what we're doing that we can get in front of clients who are also eager and actually get everybody just super stoked about doing something different um, and eager for you know all of the challenges that are associated with trying to do something different in yeah. the regulated industries. You know, anytime you're in a regulated industry, you know that if it's different, if nobody's ever done it before, that that means staying up super late uh, and you know having tough conversations, trying to get people to join up on your side because it would just be so much easier to do the same thing you did last year and the same thing that the other guy's doing. Um, and on our team, both from the client, all of the creatives we partner with, our team now, we're all like eager to have those conversations and eager to um, really push the needle forward. And when it all goes public, I, I think people are really gonna <laughs> to notice it. It's gonna feel different. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That's very cool. I wish I could tell you more about it. No, hey, I, I, I totally yeah. do. What, okay, I'll come back to the other thing I was going to ask you, but what's the deal with like healthcare advertisements and all that where you guys, the photographers, video, it's like you can't put it, like nobody's putting anything on their website, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. What's the thinking behind that? So say I shot something for some major healthcare company Mm -hmm. from my understanding is because the only thing i've done is been like some small stuff for abbott and they were like whatever but is that you can't showcase that on your site yeah i don't know what i don't know exactly what that is um other than i am sure that uh the you know the large client you know the companies they probably just don't want people thinking too much about some of the facade that goes right. into into building campaigns. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, in in non pharma work. Everybody knows this is like fake and it's make believe. Like nobody right. is a, <laughs> that when that when the Bud or when Miller Light the woman opens the can and then falls through her sofa. Nobody's yeah. going. Wait a second, did she actually fall through her sofa? There, we all know, right? I right. think I think in the world of health, when we, you're talking about in some cases life and death, and in other cases you're talking about. Um, serious safety concerns the last conversation you want to have is like you know is that real who's the model like we don't right. really want to talk about that um that's my that's what i suspect but i'm not part of those decisions it's just those are the rules that i play by right um, yeah i get you know, it in some <laughs> cases of, you know in some cases as creatives uh it helps us a little bit i think sometimes because um a lot of what i do might not look like the greatest flashiest thing in the world on its surface right. but give me a second to talk about why it's cool and why it's fresh and why it really resonated um and people will get that so at least on our website you know keeping things secret keeping them in a in a like a portfolio that i can share with somebody face to face um ensures that i can you know hold that conversation and get somebody on my side to know right like, hey you know don't you know don't judge the book by the first glance of the cover at least you know i can see that and i think you have a legit point on maybe why they don't want it out there because did you hear about the dude who was suing pepsi years ago no so pepsi i heard about, had the, a thing. I heard of, heard about the guy suing nirvana <laughs> yeah okay i just heard about that too i was like yeah. come on dude from what everything i understand you were just letting everybody in the world know that was you and i heard he has never mind tattooed on his chest so stupid yeah i'm like okay you can't go and sue, sue nirvana, nirvana at this point you're letting yeah. the whole world know one thing which is you're hard on money like, yeah exactly money. yeah you just told everybody yeah. that you can't make any cash so you yeah. sue nirvana. that's exactly what i thought too i was like damn this dude must not be making any money yeah anyway but supposedly there, pepsi had a thing it was um pepsi points years ago where you drink every pepsi you drank 
gave you like a point or two points, depending on how big it was or whatever it was. And you could win prizes based on how many points you got. And in the commercial, at the very, you know, it's like 20 points and you get a sticker, you know, 100 points, you get a t-shirt, you get 3000 points or whatever it was, you get a mountain bike. And then there was one that shows this, the dude who was going through the commercial at the very end, he gets into a Harrier, a Harrier jet and takes off. <laughs> and it says like 3 million points or whatever. I don't know what it was, but it was like some ridiculous amount of points that it would take you a lifetime. Supposedly I saw the, the breakdown on it. You'd have to drink like over a thousand Pepsis a day for 20 years or something like that to ever get this. But where Pepsi screwed up was they also said, or you can buy points for this much money per point. Well, some dude was like, I want the Harrier jet. And so he got these people to give him cash or whatever, enough money to pay for the Harrier. It's like a hundred grand or something. So he was like, here's my points. Here's the 15 points I was supposed to have, plus a check for the remaining points that I needed. I want my Harrier jet. And Pepsi was like, wrote him back, sent him his cash or whatever, and said, we appreciate that, but that's just a joke in the commercial. We don't actually can't give you a Harrier jet. He sued them. Yeah. And he lost. Yeah. Yeah. Cause... But everything <laughs> I read was even if he had won that Harrier jet wouldn't have been able to fly because the military would have stripped it clean of every single thing possible. But yeah, it was yeah. like, you can't, the judge was like, come on, even anybody's <laughs> going to know that was a joke. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Pepsi had to start putting a thing at the bottom of it, you know, that that was a joke. It wasn't real. What a bummer end to that story because I really wanted the guy to have. Yeah, I did too. I was just kept waiting. (laughs) That nobody would let him fly. It's just parked because he can't get a license (laughs) to fly the. What I think is the most difficult plane to fly in the world or something. I don't know. Yeah. There's like a handful of people that can fly a Harrier jet, right? Yeah. And I thought this kid thought I was going to, he was going to have one. (laughs) Yeah, I kept waiting. Yeah. The, they were talking about it on the radio, and I kept waiting to hear that they, the kid sued and Pepsi lost the case and had to find some way to get him a Harrier jet. Yeah, yeah that would have been really good. Yeah, he lost. So the thing you're working on now is it's – or what do you – the things you work on at Digitas, are you doing mostly stills? Are you doing motion, or are you doing a combination? Doing a combination, yeah, a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. Both I work, I touch a lot of the different aspects of the business. And so there's at least, there's two distinct brands inside the one umbrella. Both of them get video treatments and photo treatments. Um, One of them has dialogue and like actual acting. The other is mostly just a visual exercise. Um, So yeah, and you know, animation is part of this, illustration is part of it, pretty much everything at 360s, yeah. That's cool. It used to be, I guess it's probably still is, with healthcare stuff, if you did a commercial or some kind of thing like that, you had to have print to go along with it. That's what it used hmm. to, years ago, it used to be that way. So yeah. say you ran an ad for Alice or whatever the hell it is on TV, and you had to have a print ad because of all the side effects, you had to list all the side effects in the, with the print ad or something. That's yeah. It used to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, everything does have a print component. Yeah. Um, it's really important and smart that they do because if you're ever considering talking to your doctor about these things, it's like absolutely crucial that you understand um, some of the risks. Uh, yeah. Just like it's crucial that you have that conversation. If you know, if you have, you know, I think there's a there's a, like a lot of confusion because I've lived overseas and a lot of people, you know, want to say, why do you why do you even need to tell your doctor that you that you want this? Shouldn't your doctor tell you that? Right. yourself i think one of the ironies is that you know we live in in america and um not everybody goes to the doctor myself included right so yeah. i know that my foot might be hurting and i might give it three four years before i talk to a doctor about it you know <laughs> right. yeah but if there's an ad on tv that says hey does your foot hurt when you wake up in the morning does it feel so i might be like yeah it freaking does and be more encouraged to actually make the doctor visit so i think that um you know that's one of the sort of oddities of the U.S. healthcare system, but also all around the world is that we often only talk to our doctors, um, especially our primary care doctors, when we know there's a problem and when we know that there's a potential solution out there. I think otherwise we might be more, I, I know this, that a lot of us are more inclined to just 
ignore the issue, sweep it under the rug because we don't know what the hell they can do for it anyway. Yeah. Um, and then add to that mix that there's a whole population 50% of the people in the United States, the women, right, who are told repeatedly by their doctor, oh, nothing's wrong with you, right. you know, so, you know, that's another huge shame is that when you have healthcare professionals that um, aren't really listening and aren't really uh, hearing and trying to figure out what's wrong with you, um, that's another place where, you know, you know, drug companies and health companies can really help out as we can say like hey we do know there's a condition and here is one of the solutions about that um and that's where disease education and awareness campaigns really start to change lives in big ways you know i, uh, I think that. you've probably noticed like lately on tv there's been a lot of um work about schizophrenia mm -hmm. uh, yeah a, a couple different brands are launching with schizophrenia drugs last year i didn't know there was any treatment for skin yeah i didn't know anything you know? it seems like like you said in the last year it's like i started noticing because i still remember seeing the first one i was like that's the first schizophrenia commercial i've ever seen yeah so unless you are going to the doctor every single time you think something might be up with you or your family member yeah. which is like nobody right um none of us knew that that was a thing now i feel like we live in a world where uh yeah your doctor may or may not prescribe you uh a schizophrenia medication but at least the hope that something might be out there to treat you whether or not it's schizophrenia helped you get in that door to start that conversation so ultimately i think a lot of in a lot of ways we're in the business of encouraging people to talk to their doctor about their problems i think that's good so than getting that script you know yeah i mean my wife does it all the time she'll say something certain i'll say well why don't you go to the doctor because well, there's nothing they can do about it i'm like are you a doctor you yeah. don't know why don't you, don't you know? Know. That's so if a commercial did come on like right now she's having something going on with her wrist if a commercial came on and says Does your wrist feel like this or whatever she'd probably oh okay i can go maybe there is something to help me with this yeah and yeah. it really works on on the you know when you talk about advertising for the doctors as well you know my grandfather was a doctor and i remember him sitting at the breakfast table reading uh a magazine for doctors watching the braves mm -hmm. game every night uh, learning about advances because if there are advances and you got your medical degree 20 years ago you have to actually do work to keep up with those advances oh, yeah. you know we um it, sometimes the only real way to do that is inside of medical journals and it's it's a you know like in oncology there have been so many giant really important strides that are essentially changing the face of how you treat cancer um and yet we still have people that, you know, oncologists that are resistant to the idea of immunotherapies at all, you know, because they're just holdouts. Right. Um, and, you know, I think it, it's a shame that we're touting, you know, an ad about a new immunotherapy or whatever it may be um, as the reason why they should learn about it. But often a white paper with a double blind peer reviewed study is just a lot less sexy than oh, yeah. uh, a beautiful display ad. Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if the display ad is your way into reading the peer-reviewed study, uh, that's awesome. I agree. I think you got to do whatever you can to get them to, to do it. Because like you said, not all doctors are going to be that way. I have a friend of mine, he's an orthopedic surgeon. That dude's, he travels the world trying to talk to people to try and figure out how to prevent infections from his surgeries as to the point where he has no infections at all because he used to get and he's kind of found some different things but we were on vacation with him one time and that dude's watching he was from he went to the university of florida he's watching a university of florida baseball game but he's sitting there studying you know whatever is coming up while yeah. he's watching the game as well and i was just impressed by that but yeah. not all doctors are like that they're not all like that yeah not Actually, through, no not doctors under like, the oh, you'll be fine like yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and also like this has worked on almost all of my patients before i'll just right. keep doing it and it's like has it really worked like are you really checking in on all your patients and also like is a 60 percent success rate good enough for you or i'm i'm, Bro, I'm yeah, not speaking no. of any specifics here but we can always do better in what we do and there's if there are advancements in one part of the world we should try you know if we're responsible in our business, we, we got to keep up with it. You know, yeah, you wouldn't right. be where you are if you were just like, ah, digital cameras. Dude.
that newfangled digital crap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had clients that it took me years to convince to switch over to digital. I mean, mm. like there's one client, it was five years straight. Every time we shot, it was like digital. No, I still want to shoot film every time. And then finally, I was like, you are the only client I have who still wants me to shoot film. And then mm. she finally was like, okay, we'll try digital this time. I was like, well, thank you. And, and of course, never went back. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah but Mark, don't the hard drives fail? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. You know how many times I've had film get destroyed? So yeah, yeah. that happens as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But luckily, I back up my hard drives. I can't back up my film. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been very lucky with the heart. I mean, I've had a few times where the film was destroyed in the, at the lab, which that was bad. But ever since digital, mm. man, it's been, we back it up, you got it. Yeah. It's funny kind of thinking about the, the risk aversion we have now with drives, like backing things up on site, double backing, backing them up with like uh, pin, pin protected hard oh, drives, yeah. all this, all this stuff that's like seen as absolutely crucial. And yet, in the 90s we were just trusting the freaking uh, oh, yeah. gelatin you know <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> i always send it to lab and hope the machine doesn't destroy it you know yeah. when it comes out. i actually had one where the machine something screwed i was a shoot in alaska and the machine screwed up halfway through development and destroyed half the film from the Jeez. shoot so i had to go back out to alaska and reshoot everything that didn't get you know that got destroyed mm. and the, and of course the lab they gave me some money but it wasn't enough to pay for everything that happened you yeah. know but Man. yeah at least now with digital just back that up and, yeah. yeah and you're all good how do you find your photographers and directors for all these things uh, so i work with great producers yeah. um so maintaining a really good relationship with your producer you know you know and and also all the other creatives that we work with here um that creatively we know what we're looking for and then trusting producers to really narrow down a, a set of selects that creatives and client can really um work with and then i would say like the other part of it is just relationships you've had in the past yeah. so having producers who are open with you suggesting some names to throw in the hat um, then actually, you know, how you, you know, seal the deal and you get to work with them is through conversations with clients and with um, photographers themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say like more often than not, um, treatments end up looking, you know, if you're doing your job right, when you start requesting treatments, yeah. all of them end up looking about the same. Yeah. And that's good, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you the ones that don't look the same are either like head and shoulders above the rest or just like in the, you know right. yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely all right so i'm going to switch topics totally here for a little bit let's talk about your hobbies man all right let's talk about let's start off with the one that there are the two i'm really interested in but the one i'm probably most interested in is because i play guitar a little bit is the yeah. building the two amps. yeah that's How what you, i'm that, that's my thing right now especially during covid too like transitioning from because none of my friends are playing live anymore i've yeah. actually like i haven't built a guitar amp in a year which is really weird but i've built a ton of hi-fi amps so i'm like knowing that i i sort of took that skill and being like i'm sitting at home listening to records on like a you know on something i didn't build and i've got right. the skills to build something so since covid started i've completely rebuilt all my hi-fi system all that's handmade cool. um but yeah, it's still, it's still doing guitar amps. It's just like, uh, we got to wait for the world to open before people start needing, you know, tune-ups and repairs in their existing amps or custom built bespoke amps, you know. It's, it's, How did you get into all that? Well, you play guitar. So you probably yeah. remember when like a guitar amp you wanted was outside of your price range. Oh yeah. It's really, you know, whether it's a, twin or a marshall half stack or something like yeah, i always always wanted um, a marshall half stack and I just, I just can't afford that thing you'll never be able to afford yeah. it right not not unless you're you know an actual gigging working musician yeah. even if you could afford it you couldn't really justify having it um and so that was me and and that was all my friends and uh and most people get into it by starting with pedals i didn't really start with pedals i was much more 
uh, need based. And so while pedals were would have been cheaper and easier to build, like I really wanted a twin or I really wanted a, a deluxe and everybody else did too. And so I think I started by repairing old Ampegs and understanding yeah. understanding how they worked a little bit. So you could buy, you know, at the time you could go on in the weekly or, or uh, to a record store that sold guitars or a little bit, you know, find something that either didn't work at all for really cheap or right. um, worked a little bit and was cheap and soup it up and mod it. So I think I started in mods and repairs. And then in the end, you know, you've, you've got your skills enough, you can buy a kit and right. So then you do a kit and you, and you aim real high with the kit, you know, you're like, what's, yeah. what's a dream <laughs> that I could never be able to afford. Um, and then uh, either it works or it doesn't. Um, hopefully it works. All of my kits have worked because, you know, uh, I, I'm, I like researching and I like troubleshooting and I already had sort of a background in repairs. Um, and then the next big graduation is, um, you find a friend who's a real gigging musician and who says, I've always wanted this, but I've always wanted it to do this a little differently. And then you start figuring out a recipe and you build something custom from scratch. So you're like, I want the power stage of an AC30 and I want, you know, it to have a, a basement like, you know, breakup, but I want it to have two channels and I want one channel way hotter than the other. Right. And so you, you come right. up with this recipe that doesn't exist in the world. And then, uh, knowing enough about how, how all the other amps are built, you can kind of just like, I'm going to make this sound really easy. It's not this easy, but you can kind of like say, take this part and then this part and fit them together. And it, where they don't fit together, you solve for that. So that's right. where you spend all your time is figuring out how to make the input stage and the preamp and the phase inverter and then the power amp stage all fit together and work in harmony. Um, and then eventually you you know enough math to build something truly from scratch. Um, it's, not, it's not all math, but like know enough about like the circuits. So that's how you get into it. Starts with starts with need and no money. Right. And it ends with sort of like <laughs> a ton of interest. And before you know it, you've got one whole room in your house that's devoted to nothing but amp building. <laughs> you know, oh, there's wow. just like oscilloscopes and signal generators everywhere. Um, Lately, I've been I've sort of like shelved the oscilloscope type type stuff, and I've actually built a little PC based oscilloscope thing where I can measure oh, that's distortion, cool. and I can I can make some pretty precise measurements now. Um, that's one of the things that I I really needed to start building hi-fi amps because hi-fi amps are make it or break it on one percent versus point one percent distortion. Um, yeah. So if you, if you don't have a way of measuring those two things, you can't really go anywhere. Um, guitar amps are, are much more like the more distortion, the better, or yeah. just like, that sounds good. That sounds better. It's all very ear-based. Not to say that hi-fi isn't ear-based, but you at least have to start with some really good measuring techniques. Well, yeah, I would think, because you could probably, because having that little bit of distortion on your hi-fi amp is going to be a little more irritating than it is on your guitar amp. Yeah, or or like you know, you find the world of hi-fi is weird. There's um, you, there's people that are like won't live with any amount of distortion, um, and a lot of times those people don't really understand the nature of distortion. At least you know this is a hot right. topic, but yeah, um, you know, a, when we measure amplifiers, we measure how much a sine wave on the input can look exactly like that sine wave on the output. Um, the real crux of the matter is you're measuring sine waves. Um, when you actually start making noises that have really complicated transients and really complicated waveforms where, uh, you know, one top half of the waveform is completely different than the 180 degree version of that waveform, right. you start to realize that like, hey, testing just on sine waves doesn't get you everywhere. Um, then there's a whole other side of hi-fi where people are just like, it sounds good to me and to my ears and that's cool. Right. Uh, but often you find that those people like have five amps and two sets of speakers because they're like this amp with these speakers sounds great for Beatles. Right. And then oh, wow. this amp and this one is what I use when I'm listening to like folk rock or something. And, yeah. and, you, and then you start realizing, oh, OK, so they're adding and subtracting distortion based on their tastes of listening to the music. And I fall somewhere in between. I really like the science of measurement, but I understand that shortcomings. Um, and I definitely don't want to be in a world where I'm deliberately adding distortion 
to music because I really respect the recording engineers and the master yeah. engineers that made that music. Well, that is some of the I, stuff with all the new everything digital that it was kind of cool. I remember when people were recording on on the tape, you could actually get to a little more of that distortion sometimes, which made it mm -hmm. sound a little bit cooler. Where in digital, everybody's watching the levels so much and playing with it so much that you don't quite get the same sound. Yeah, that you can when you don't. I imagine it's a little bit like a like photography too, right? Like you can add a rim light to a person, yeah. and you get that right to do it because you're a photographer. And I bet it kind of irks you when you hand something off and then you see that retouching has had a lot of liberties with your image. I think yeah. that's kind of how it is. Like if you've got a tape machine and you're in the studio and you're the band and the engineer, you have 100% of the right to fuck that right. distortion, do whatever you want. Make it exactly as crazy as you want to be, I, it, but it's disrespectful for them to take it into your house and then start applying your own things to it and really changing the character of the music. That said, there, you know, I'm on both sides of the fence here. Like I thought up an analogy the other day, which is like a painter makes a painting in a certain north facing light of their studio and it looks the way that they wanted it to in the studio. Which right. isn't to say that when I choose a room in my house, I don't get to decide, hey, it looks a little better in this room than in this room. And I'm not even thinking about what the artist studio looks like. Yeah. So there's distortion involved with my enjoyment of this painting. And the distortion is that my room looks different than their room. My light looks different than their light. That is distortion, yet I can still enjoy the painting. And I don't feel the need that every photo print or every painting or every sculpture in the world has got to be displayed in the exact same environment as it was created. Um, so, I agree, and I think you you got a good point, at least for me on the photography end, where I've definitely handed off images and seen the retouching afterwards, and like, what the hell? This mm. that's nothing like I would have done it. I don't like. It. And then there are other times where you look at it and go, they did a great job. So it kind of depends on the hands of the person who gets it afterwards. I mean, sometimes maybe that extra little distortion, but you're as an artist, you're like, all right, that was cool. I didn't, yeah. we didn't hit enough or we didn't think about that. And then other times you'd be like, what the hell? That was supposed to be very clean. And now you've added some distortion to it. That's annoying yeah. as hell to me. I think we can probably agree that, you know, no analogy is perfect. And the exactly. retoucher certainly, yeah. the retoucher certainly plays a role in the creative here. But like, let's agree that if the offset printer decides that they want to add more magenta, like, yeah no. yes <laughs> yeah absolutely yes absolutely yeah all right i'm going to share my screen because i want to move on to another one of your things and this is definitely visual and this dude the can you see it is it up there oh yeah there you all right. go the pumpkin carving thing yeah this is crazy man i mean yeah how did you get into this and I mean, because to me, to be able to do it with the subtleties and the lights and the darks and the mids, just in general and anything, is pretty impressive on a pumpkin. But then to go in and do these images where you look at them and you can tell, you know, who these people are, is to me is extremely impressive because not only are you extremely artistic but you also know the technical side of how to take away just enough from this pumpkin to get the lights where you want the highlights and the darks and all that i mean how when did you get into doing the whole pumpkin thing uh long time ago i can't really remember uh i'm sure it was a martha stewart magazine where i saw her doing something and i was like i gotta try this um i was living in that mansion that I was telling you about where I didn't have to have a job it was it was Halloween and uh yeah I just gave it a shot I don't know um how you get into something like this is is a little weird it's just an it's the first experiment and I don't know you know I've been a portrait painter almost my whole life I love I love finding likenesses right um whether yeah. it's you know on paint or with pencil and this was just like the most difficult challenge for how to find a likeness these right here, the um, scariest couple in Hollywood, Tom Cruise, Katie Holmes, those are really <laughs> early. Those are some of my earliest ones. Um, that Tom Cruise one was one of the most difficult ones ever. Uh, I mean, the fact that so you got like the hair and then the shadows from the hair. 
Yeah, th that's all added in there. I'll tell you the secret to pumpkin design a little bit. I mean, it's probably pretty obvious. Everything has to connect with everything else. Right. So you can't have anything floating in space. So often like to have a key light, like you have on Bieber here, huh. you know, means that anything, any detail on that key light side has to be attached to something else. Uh, so you have to have that, the hair of those bangs to actually make sure that the eye socket can connect to the rest oh, of yeah. the pumpkin. Um, if that stuff isn't there, uh, you have to say like, all right, can I add it and still get a likeness? And so for Tom Cruise, you know, finding those wisps helps support his nose and his eye. Um, Oh, and you, yeah. you add them in and you figure it out and you're like, oh, it's actually adding kind of a little bit of something, uh, especially if the gaze is going that way, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it, a planning and figuring out, you know, your drawing and, and making your template with a, just a pencil and pen or a, a photo, right, is uh, all of the real work. And then the actual carving takes place in like maybe an hour or two. You can do this in an hour or two? You have to because they're real pumpkins. There are a lot oh, of pumpkin yeah. artists that do like plastic pumpkins or oh. acrylic pumpkins, but yeah. I really like working with a real gourd, like a real wet gourd. Yeah. Um, and, and so often they only last one night. I do them on Halloween. That's another thing is I'll try to do one pumpkin for social media prior to Halloween, but my sort of what I want to be that, I mean, this is going to sound obnoxious, but I want to be like the flagship pumpkin. I'll yeah. carve just on Halloween. And so- at, in our neighborhood, I'll get a lot of visitors to the porch on Halloween night. I bet you will. I love this Tom Petty one. That's one of the ones I'm most proud of. Yeah. Mostly just because I'm obsessed with um, finding a likeness and studying a face. And I, I think that when you think about Tom Petty, a lot of times people don't really think about the intricacies around his mouth. But when you actually draw yeah. it and you, and you see it, all those little wrinkles around his um, mouth muscles, that's what makes him Tom Petty, to me at least. Yeah, I mean, this is just, yeah. I I'm, wish I could have gotten his hair blonde, but blonde hair is really hard on a pumpkin. <laughs> oh, I would think. Yeah, dude, I'm blown away. I mean, this is Thank really you. some incredible stuff. That's yeah, I'm trying to figure out what to do this year. Find, and that's the other hardest part is finding the appropriate one for the year. Oh, yeah, I bet. So, okay, you have obviously a ton of different hobbies. So you also paint. You're a video editor, director. Um, you do, not only do you build the tube amps for the guitars and for hi-fi, you also make the cabinets as well with the speakers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I love woodworking. So if you had to pick one between all your hobbies and your actual job, and it all paid the same or it all paid nothing, which one would you pick? I think it would have to change year by year. Right now, I would build amps. Okay. Um, but that's just because that's sort of the obsession I'm following, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, I can who see knows? That. And, and it's an inside hobby, and I'm not, a real, I'm not a real summer guy. So to be inside, not baking outside, it seems like building little amps is... Um, so, you know, some people are probably like, oh, but the soldering iron's really hot. It's not that hot. It's not going to like heat up the room or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah. But then come, come winter time when things cool off a little bit, I, I love bicycle touring. I would love to be paid the bicycle tour. So yeah, getting out, like putting camping gear on a bike and just oh, yeah. going for 20 days camping every night is another big hobby. Um, it doesn't really make sense to put on a website, but that's like... Ooh, that is really, really fun. I don't know if you've ever gone on like a long overnight bike trip, but no, uh, I've never biked more than about two, three miles, probably. Oh, uh, it's so it's so Maybe fun to, to like wake up two nights away from your house and be like, oh my god, I'm 150 miles away from my house, and I got here on on a bike. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but then I don't know. I I think right now it's amps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It might be video come winter time, but who knows? Did you see talking about um the taking your bike and going camping did you see the little five i think he's five years old who hiked the appalachian trail with his parents no i didn't the whole That's thing the dude started in january and it took him 200 days and they went all the way from one end to the other and yeah. hiked the whole entire thing and it was amazing the little kid was looked like he loved it loved every second of it my only question was what the hell do his parents do that they can take 200 days off and not work 
But I guess it was yeah. during all this COVID. Maybe they were just you know stopping and catching their Wi-Fi and working during the day for a minute or two, and then heading it back yeah. out. Yeah, who knows? Maybe they also made sacrifices because they realigned their priorities. You know, it could be. That kid, maybe they just saved up the cash. Kid, They're good. Yeah, that kid uh, is going to carry that with him or her their whole life. Oh yeah. Uh, and when you have a memory like that that you did with your family, a giant accomplishment, you try to you know when you're in your 40s and 50s try to put a dollar value on that. Oh yeah. It's priceless. No way. Priceless. Yeah. yeah. Who cares what I, you know? If if you I, one day I want to do it. One day I really want to do it. I've got all my hiking gear. I, yeah, I gotta lose probably. 60 50 pounds to do it <laughs> some part of me is like i'll just lose the 60 pounds on trail um <laughs> that might happen like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah one day i would really love to do that i'd also really love to bike uh, from coast to coast that'd be another yeah dream. i want to go coast to coast but i don't want to bike i want to get in a car and drive coast to coast and i was going to try and talk my family into doing it this this summer and I talked to a friend of mine who's done it multiple times and i was like we're gonna rent an rv and drive because dude just fly to texas he said, because mm. there's really nothing between North Carolina and Texas to see. He said, and then when you get to Texas, then take it from there. But they wouldn't even do that. So they're like, you can ah. find stuff to do between there. I drove my, I drove, my, I have a 50 year old truck with no air conditioning. And we drove it coast to coast like five years ago. And it was so fun. Um, and yeah, there is stuff great. to see. There is stuff to see. I, I don't know. I'll say on my return trip, my girlfriend's family, she lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. And, uh, I will say she flew back from Lincoln, Nebraska, because she wanted to spend some time with her family. And on that return trip, I did try to make it as quickly as I could. And yeah. I did, I did um, from St. Joseph, Missouri, which is real close to Lincoln. I made it to Philly in one stint, wow. which is the longest I've ever driven uh, before. But I was kind of primed and ready to do it. Um, but yeah, it's how many hours it. was it's that? Hard um probably 2021 20, or something like that Damn. here's the here's the trick when you have a really loud truck yeah um it keeps you awake <laughs> yeah. yeah and no ac yeah 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 re, re, you gotta have a really loud v8 so you can't fall asleep you know <laughs> yeah damn hell I don't know, man. That's tough. I've I've done jobs where I was in Memphis and I would work all day long and then get in the car when I was younger and drive that 10 and a half hours. And by the time about 3 a.m. hit, I was doing everything I could to keep my eyes open. But I didn't have a very loud V8 either. So <laughs> maybe, that was, maybe that was the difference. So, all right. So tell me, this is the last question for you. Okay. What is the strangest, coolest, best thing that you can or best story that you have since you've started in this whole advertising world um, hmm. that's a real tough one to end on mark um i don't know I, it hasn't been that strange for me or maybe you know well, that's the thing. Strange. Sometimes you think, oh, that's not strange. And then you say, you tell the story, like, here's something that's a little weird, but it's not that big a deal. And then other people go, what the hell? Yeah. The only, yeah, I guess the only thing that's ever happened that was kind of weird is no, there's been a lot of weird things. The most recent weird thing to happen was we, um, we went through casting to get a guy and he needed part of the shoot was, to, you know, he needed to like lay down on his back and do a bunch of poses. Um, and it wasn't disclosed to us that he only had one leg. And so he showed up and went through wardrobe and everything and you couldn't see it. You, you couldn't see it at all. But then he laid down and, you know, his leg was was a, you know, an aluminum right. rod. And so there was no no real recourse. And we didn't even know about it until we started looking in the camera. And we were like, what's going on with his leg? So we had to like artificially stuff the pants of his leg. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> that okay. was, see, that's a little strange. That doesn't happen to everybody yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah, and it, but it's not a big deal. And, you know, we, we may do. And I have, you know, I have a lot of, I have a pretty close friend of mine that only has one leg. And it's, yeah, it's funny how you you know you just forget about it after a while you don't even notice it at all right and i guess that's just, i guess, i suppose that's just what happened <laughs> yeah i knew a guy in college um and he had he he had a hook kind of a, like a clamp hook for an arm mm -hmm. for a hand like mm -hmm. from like the middle of his arm and when you first met him you're like whoa that thing's because it wasn't it didn't look like a hand it was literally like a clamp claw mm -hmm. kind of thing 
but after you know like a couple of days of hanging out with the dude or a couple of times hanging out with him you just forgot all about it and just like mm. you know there he is until he was holding yeah. a beer up and would do it like that with the beer you know yeah. <laughs> okay now i remember that you are missing a hand but yeah well dude that was cool well thank you for doing this well thank you yeah um you know have a have a great rest of the weekend i can't wait for this to come out yeah it's, it was good man and i can tell you're still like very into uh your job and what you do and all that so that's that's good to see you didn't you don't yeah, seem yeah. bored with it <laughs> no not yeah. at all but i I also have a, a bunch of side things to keep me excited too so. yeah yes you do yeah which is great because like my wife has nothing and <laughs> we have to find her something i'll Here. tell you what get her into plastering <laughs> I'll try. She was yeah, in the gardening for a minute and then uh, I don't know what happened with that. We're trying to get her back into that a little bit so I don't have to do so much out in the yard. Yeah. But right, have cool. her do it. Well, thank have you, a great man. Afternoon, Mark.